Good morning and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft, alongside Ronnie Dahl. Hey, uh, Tyler. Yes. I keep saying you need your own sports show. Like the way you just ramble and come up with these stats in the sports world, you're amazing. I think we should have Tyler's talk oh, with Tyler's uh, talk, okay. sports radio. What do you think? I, I, I like that idea. You know, you know, if, 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 if 97 won the ticket, I love what they do over there. And I love Mike Valenti over there. But, you know, I'd, I'd be glad to also do a show called Three Hours of Screaming and Talk Sports. <laughs> Can I be your agent? Go for it. Uh, welcome, though. We won't be uh, talking sports very much today. Uh, I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studio. Tyler is in the studio back in the greater West Bloomfield area. So we want to say thank you for joining us for the Friday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. It's Friday, November 20th. And Tyler... Thanksgiving is less than a week away. Do you have any Thanksgiving plans? I had had some plans. I was going to go across the state with uh, my mother's side of the family and visit my cousins and my aunt and uncle. However, given the COVID-19 situation, that's definitely not going to happen. My, my phone's going off in agreement. And um, I'm still formulating the plans for what may or may not happen next week. Hey, the weather is nice. I'm, I may... St- still at least go to my mom and my stepdad my stepdads for the, the occasion otherwise uh it's, it's very likely that we will keep distant this holiday season as uh COVID-19 is definitely surging in our local area and I have family that works in a hospital uh, you know and, and so let's just go ahead and jump into the headlines with that Tyler because it's sure. almost like you read my headlines to know what the CDC is saying the CDC is now warning Americans not to travel this Thanksgiving. So it's great that you and your family have made that decision. So with the coronavirus surging out of control, the nation's top public health agency is pleading with Americans, do not travel for Thanksgiving and do not spend the holiday with people from outside of your household, which really is a hard thing for people who maybe live alone. Um, so it was some of the firmest guidance yet from the government on curtailing traditional gatherings to fight the outbreak, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, issuing the recommendations just one week before Thanksgiving at a time when infections, hospitalizations, and deaths are skyrocketing not only here in Michigan, but across the country as well. And in many areas, the healthcare system is being squeezed by a combination of sick patients, filling up beds and medical workers falling ill themselves. So if families do decide to include returning college students, that's kind of one of the big talks right now, Um, but also maybe military members or others Uh, For your Thanksgiving dinner, the CDC is recommending that the hosts take added precautions. Try to have your gathering outside if you can, although here in the state of Michigan, it looks like the weather's only going to be in the 40s, Um, so it might be a little chilly for an outdoor Thanksgiving dinner, but they're also asking that people keep six feet apart and you wear a mask, and just one person serves the meal, so you do not want to share the utensils it is such a, a tough time, um, Tyler, for so many of us because we have these annual traditions and this is a time where we want to be with our loved ones because in a lot of cases, uh, we haven't seen one another in how many months due to this pandemic. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a tough time for a lot of families and a tough decision to make for a lot of families that they need to do the right thing and the smart thing to prevent the spread of the virus, especially within their family. But more than that, in the greater community as it surges throughout the U.S. And I mean, yesterday we, we spoke with someone from Michigan Health and Hospital Association who, who had said that staffing is the biggest problem right now. And, and so it's key that we are a keeping those that work in hospitals safe and healthy, but also that we aren't overwhelming these hospital systems because unlike the first initial wave of the pandemic, it's not so much in pockets in certain states 
and heavier in some places and lighter in the others. It's pretty heavy everywhere and there's not a whole lot of overflow staffing. So a lot to consider and a lot of families that may have to make some tough decisions regarding their holiday plans this year. But I did read something interesting online that uh, Governor Whitmer actually had, tw had, had spoken on, on online about uh, Zoom waiving their 40 minute time limit on Thanksgiving in Michigan, in Michigan uh, to allow families to spend that time together, but at a safe Can distance. Can you hear me? Yeah, so uh, yeah, hmm. that's an interesting Stand thing there, um, Tyler, as well, that um, she is allowed for the, or, or Zoom is allowing for that. I know they did it in the beginning of the pandemic, but they're also going to be doing it for um, the holidays. So um, you can maybe just, just have a virtual Thanksgiving. And I, I will say I'm not I'm not really good at cooking. I, I I think I've said this before. Usually I go to my twin sister's house, and my role is to bring the bread and the rolls. So that's uh, the ability of my cooking um, status. But really, it's it's about being safe because the one thing that the chief executive medical director um, Caldoun said yesterday during that um, press conference was you don't want to have um, Thanksgiving dinner and then do a funeral for the um, new year. So kind of puts things in perspective. It's not so much about your health, it's about those around you. And um, everyone reacts differently to this virus and we need to keep that in perspective. Although I will say one, uh, um, a big story coming out yesterday was a about the Thanksgiving Day Parade. So yes. while they had already made changes yes. about the Thanksgiving Day Parade, um, by not allowing spectators, they were still planning to do the parade, um, blocking off the streets so spectators and gawkers couldn't come and join in. However, uh, the city is saying, nope, that's not going to happen. And so uh, Detroit's top public health official has now scuttled the plans for that live performance in downtown next week for the city's annual Thanksgiving Day Parade. Um, the chief public health officer for the city of Detroit determined that the organizers plans to have about 800 participants and 22 flo floats in downtown for the live parade would violate Michigan's recent public health restrictions on outdoor gatherings of more than 25 people. So those now canceled plans called for the parade to be broadcast live on Woodward near the old Hudson's department store site and security guards were going to be hired to kind of block the road and keep the gawkers away so crowds didn't gather. Now instead, they have been thrown a curveball as of yesterday and there is going to be a virtual parade for our TV viewers to enjoy Thanksgiving morning. However, I'm just wondering, uh, Tyler, what were the conversations behind the scenes on this one one week before this event's about to take place and they have to come up with a virtual presentation of what that's going to look like? It's going to be kind of anyone's guess right now. Yeah, it's a tough situation for the parade and uh, I was, I was Confused a little bit yesterday when I did see this headline. I saw it from another, from a, its original uh, publication, which was the uh, Detroit Free Press. And my initial thought was, hmm, I thought they had already suspended this parade or had uh, canceled it for this year. And I wasn't sure about that. I know other parades had, so I probably was confusing it. But them going virtual, that that is really interesting, and that is something that's a lot tougher said than done, especially with less than a week's notice now uh, less than a week's time frame to put that together these virtual events much like these in-person events are heavily complicated and require a lot of detail a lot of pre-planning and a lot of troubleshooting also on the technical side and on the entertainment side as they try to get all these different people all these different vendors all of these different many events within an event into this total on the virtual end yeah, so uh, from my, what the plan was, is they were still going to do the parade, yes. but 
they weren't going to allow crowds to gather. And it okay. was even a scaled down version of the parade than what we're used to. But there was still going to be a parade going down Woodward with the floats. But you think about that and pulling that off, um, you need, you know, people running the cameras and uh, just the technical side of making this happen. But now the city of Detroit saying, no, you have to do it virtually. I don't know what that's going to look like. Um, I will say to the parade company, they're a great organization for us, but uh, people forget they're really a charity event and they donate a lot of money. And usually the night before Thanksgiving, they do the huge hobgobble novel, which is um, a black tie event, uh, raises a lot of money for these charities as well. But after the parade, I don't know if people uh, it knew this, but after the parade, you can actually go and visit um, where they put the parades together and where they store them. And it's um, great. That's one of the things I got to do uh, when I worked, I think it was at Fox 2, you know, doing that weekend morning show. You got oh, to yeah. do all these fun things. And the fun thing one year was, uh, you know, going to the parade company and, and seeing how they designed these floats. But also it is open to the public after the parade to come and see the floats up close. So Virtually, I don't, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this gets pulled off. Um, one week, less than a week before the show. But it, it, it's such a staple here in the community. You know, one of the other things that um, happens downtown, because usually you like to go downtown, you experience downtown Detroit, the campus marshes, um, the outdoor ski, ice skating rink, it was also announced that they're now closing down because I think the thought process was they were going to be allowed to be open because they were outdoors. Well, that's not happening now. The outdoor ice skating rink at Campus Marshes is going to close for at least three weeks due to those new restrictions. So as the COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations climb throughout the state, the MDHHS enacted the three-week pause, as they like to say, they don't want to use the word shutdown, they're calling it a pause, that ramps up restrictions for restaurants, bars, high schools, colleges, and more. So from November 18th or, 18th or 16th through um, the 8th, December 8th, Michigan restaurants, bars cannot offer indoor dining, high schools and colleges have to switch to virtual, and casinos, movie theaters, stadiums, and arenas through Michigan also have to remain closed. Well, hmm. people thought because the ice skating rink was outdoors, it was going to be okay. Well, now, yesterday, the officials did do an update to the restrictions indicating to include both indoor and outdoor ice skating rinks. So right now, um, Campus Marshes Park, the ice skating rink downtown, slated to reopen on December the 9th. Have you ever gone ice skating downtown, Tyler? I have not gone ice skating downtown. I've actually never been ice skating. I've been rollerblading. That's an interesting experience. What? Very comical. But ice skating, I have not actually done. Oh my God. Tyler, I feel like you're the young whippersnapper between the two of us. And I'm like- That's what they say. You haven't done the turkey trot. I get maybe that you uh, don't want to wear a turkey outfit. Oh, no, I I, I, that's that's you. that's what I'm most okay with. <laughs> but ice skating uh, downtown campus marshes. I, and Tyler, it's like a great date night. You want to impress a girl? Take her ice skating at campus marshes. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if that's going to be impressive as much as making making her laugh. But it is a good <laughs> idea. And I'm all for but comedy. <laughs> You can laugh together, though, right? Sure, as she's nursing me back to health after I fall on, on my uh, rear end. <laughs> oh, Tyler, Tyler. We got to get you out. We do. Tyler we works do. too much, by the way. I don't want to count how many hours uh, he works a week for Civic Center TV, but I it's agree. a lot. So we need to get him out. And when ice skating reopens... The four of us, me, you, Jake, and Larry, are all going ice skating. And we're all going to be in marshes. turkey outfits, yes. Yeah, well, no, it'll be after Thanksgiving, so you don't need your turkey outfit. But you know what? Okay. We can wear okay. ugly sweaters. Oh, that's a great idea. I like that idea. We'll wear our ugly Christmas sweaters, and right now, 
I am going to say that we need a team bonding experience of outdoor <laughs> ice skating at Campus Marshall. So I'm going to make it happen, Tyler. Lovely. Lovely idea. <laughs> yeah, I know you're looking forward to it. Hey, uh, the last uh, story of our day under our headlines, again, if you go to civiccentertv.com, click on coronavirus. That's where we put um, all the day's headlines and the news. Uh, really, this has been a huge talker. Kelly Stafford apologizing now for her Michigan dictatorship rant. This has been flowing through um, social media but then got picked up yes. by the local news organizations. And now national news has picked up the story as well. Kelly Stafford, of course, is the wife of Detroit Lions quarterback, Matthew Stafford, now apologizing for calling Michigan a dictatorship during a social media rant inspired by the state's new COVID-19 restrictions. Her comments came on the second day of Michigan's three week COVID-19 pause which banned, as we've been talking about, indoor dining at restaurants, shut down in-person classes for college and high school students, and um, also uh, banned all attendance at sporting events. Kelly Stafford returned to Instagram on Thursday, apologized both on video through her story and with a post saying, in part, I should have never used the word dictatorship. I got caught up in the heat of the moment. That is my fault. One of her things, it's a very long um, Instagram post. So those that don't follow her, we have the link to the story on civiccentertv.com and it has a link also to her entire uh, statement. But, you know, for her, she, she was saying that she has friends that are suffering financially because their businesses are on the brink of shutdown now because of these, you know, pausing per se, um, in the state of Michigan. And so she's apologizing, she, you know, at the end of the day, she's a regular individual and she's expressing her opinion. And, um, you know, when you do things in the heat of the moment, it's really kind of a good lesson for all of us, Tyler, that when you go to post something, stop and think about what you're posting or how yeah. maybe you're saying it. Um, but she was frustrated because she has friends that are being financially impacted by um, the pause and this latest restriction to try to contain COVID-19. Um, my guess though is uh, maybe the Lions PR department also got involved in this. Yeah, I think they should embrace it, you know, maybe uh, make some, ni some nice Photoshop pictures of Matt Matthew Stafford on, as different dictators, you know, Joseph Stalin, the offense. Uh, now, now say done after four games, uh, Kim Jong-un win per season, you know? It could work. Oh, Tyler, Tyler. Hey, Tyler, also, but uh, did you hear um, your team, the Spartans, are not going to be playing this weekend? Yeah, no, there was a big uh, outbreak of Karanis on the uh, Maryland team. Yes. Yeah, too bad it couldn't go down for a win for your team. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, we weren't going to win anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but I hey, I, look why, on the bright side, that's though. Why they should get the win. Look right? on the bright side, though, Ronnie. Rock Lombardi can't throw any interceptions this weekend. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, so, yeah, it, going into this um, more than eight months in, and we are still navigating it. And still, uh, I don't think until that vaccine is widely available are we going to come out on the other end of this pandemic. So, a lot of things changing. Over the holiday season, um, it, the big thing that's going to be interesting, as we were saying, uh, the governor did hold a press conference yesterday, is will this three-week shutdown pause be enough for them to um, go ahead and restart uh, the economy? That's one of the things we're going to have to wait and see. But with that, uh, hey, uh, we want to say thank you again for watching uh, the Oakland County Megacast. You can catch us right here on Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon. Tyler and I are hanging out, talking to all the newsmakers, movers and shakers, business people, and elected leaders about this latest pandemic and all the latest news. And you can catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Channel 15 if you have Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. If you're out driving around, tune us into the radio. 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Beth. We also want to say thank you to the West Bloomfield Fire Department 
because they are live streaming today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast on their Facebook page. And we want to say thank you to them uh, and all of their followers, but also um, a big thank you to the fire department and all the first responders for their service because they are facing very challenging times right now as well. We're going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast, but when we come back, a lot to get to over the next hour and 45 minutes. First up, we will be speaking with the co-founder and CEO of the Subscription Trade Association. Tyler, one thing I love about this show is I learn something new each and every day. I didn't even know there was such an association, so I'm excited to talk to them about uh, their organization, but also how this is pandemic is impacting some uh, local businesses. So we'll be right back on the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's gonna be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on, to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Great to have you with us on the Friday edition of the Oakland County Bay and Pass. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studio while Mr. Tyler Keith joins us from the West Bloomfield studio of Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. You know, the Subscription Trade Association is a growing community of innovators, entrepreneurs, leaders, and dedicated teams eager to scale their businesses and catalyze the subscription industry. I will say, before today, I didn't even realize that this industry actually existed, which is one of the great things about the Oakland County Megacast is because we try to reach out to various individuals from all walks of life to try to educate you about these industries, but also how they're surviving during the pandemic. And with that, let's go ahead and bring in Paul Chambers. He is the co-founder and CEO of the Subscription Trade Association. Paul, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Ronnie. I appreciate it. I didn't know you existed. And if I didn't know, I'm sure there are a lot of other people. Fill us in on exactly who you are and the mission. Well, that's thank you so much for having me so we can share this with more people. We are working to fill the world with subscription joy. And the Subscription Trade Association, or as we call it, SUBTA, is um, think about anything you subscribe you subscribe to as a consumer from Netflix and Peloton to FabFitFun and Dollar Shave Club, those subscriptions that are in our lives, we help fuel that industry and help those companies grow even better. It's amazing to me that you're located right here in our backyard. Yeah, right here in Troy, Michigan. And uh, we've, we've been growing this uh, industry and helping grow this industry for the past five years now. How did you get started? So actually originally launched a subscription box called the Gentleman's Box back in 2014 and saw a growing space in a growing industry and decided to help bring that industry together as well. So we launched our first conference right downtown Detroit and brought 200 people in the room, some of the best and brightest minds, and have continued to grow that. And pre-COVID last year, we held our, our last in-person event called Sub Summit. We had over a thousand different subscription companies in the room. So it was so fun and fantastic. And you can see I'm surrounded by subscription boxes here myself today. Okay, so um, 
Paul, you, you mentioned the gentleman's box. What is that? And are the we ge- talking about like, where you monthly get like these gifts or is this really for every company? Absolutely. So a lot of companies are introducing subscription now, whether it be a membership where you have access to different things, a, a replenishment where you're going to get razors and beauty products every single month, or like with the gentleman's box, that's actually it right there. It's discovery and delight, it's showing you things that you didn't know existed or really didn't know you wanted or, or you know needed there in your life. And so uh, it's going to introduce new products to you. It's going to show you new fashion items every month. Now we're not dressing up as much anymore. So the gentleman's box has shifted and pivoted to offer really cool lifestyle products and different things that we can use in our daily lives. I will say though, as a, a, a chick, um, that sounds like a great gift yeah. to get your significant other because some guys are a bit fashion challenged. Yeah, sometimes. And that's or what, grooming challenged at that as well. <laughs> that too. I'm doing like I'm doing okay today, you know. But I'm a firefighter, so I always got to keep a clean shaven face. Uh, but one of the things that is fun with subscription boxes, there's so many different options out there for anybody in your life. You know, just below the gentleman's box is Yogi Surprise. So if you have somebody that's interested in yoga and, and being fit, there's that box. There's, you know, Fab Fit Fun, which is, you know, lifestyle products and fun things for, you know, anybody that you can think of in your life. How has the pandemic impacted your business overall? So for Subta and, and us as a trade association, we've continued to you know, help people in a virtual way and help these businesses in a virtual fashion. We used to hold an in-person event. We moved that virtually this year. Um, but for the subscription businesses that are part of our trade association, it's almost been like Christmas-like level of sales and, and holiday-like level of sales since March, as more and more consumers are trying to find things to do in unique ways to help stay busy while they've been in quarantine. So you see you know, the clay box back over there, which is a fun, unique way to ki- keep kids engaged. But another great local one is the Tinker Tots box run by Katie Roman here, uh, based out of Detroit. And this is a great way, you know, STEM-like activities to help kids stay engaged and, and kind of reduce that screen time sometimes because kids, kids get so much of it today. Oh, that they certainly do. So Paul, I'm curious, because in the middle of the pandemic, people's lives are changing. And um, as their life changes, if they thought about starting up their own business, is this a good time for them to do that? Because if you can offer something virtually such as this, is this what consumers are looking for? So you're asking a serial entrepreneur if it's a great time to start a business. I always say yes. I absolutely love starting businesses. But, you know, one of the beautiful things about what's out there today is it's, it's so easy to spin up. A new business. If you have an idea, it's not, there aren't many barriers to getting that started. There's some great tools out there like CrateJoy or Shopify that allow you to spin up an e-commerce store in an instant. So I say absolutely, it's always a great time to start a business, especially right now where more and more people are turning to e-commerce for their shopping. Well, and also if you're an individual, maybe you're on unemployment Mm -hmm. and you're worried about the market that you worked in, or you've always had a dream or a passion, maybe this is the time to follow it. Absolutely. And we've got a lot of great resources out there. We have a free membership at Subto, so anybody can join and sign up and learn how to start a subscription business. And we can help point them in the right direction to get out there and get started with it. Because as you can see, there's tons of opportunities and tons of great ways that you can find, find and follow your passion, I like to say. This is so interesting to me, but I will say one of the things that's my pet peeve is sometimes I'll, I'll sign up for these subscription services and then when I decide I don't want them anymore, I keep forgetting to cancel them. And canceling them is not so easy sometimes. Sometimes, and, and there have been a lot of um, recent laws in different states that have, I don't wanna say forced hands of, of companies to make the cancellation process easier, but some of that has. But the companies that know really well that giving an opportunity for a customer to, you know, like say cancel, but maybe pause or skip a month or take some time away from the subscription, creates greater relationship with that customer for a greater lifetime value. So if I give you the chance to maybe take a break for two months because you have too much of one product or you don't need, you wanna save your, save your money for a couple months, giving that ability makes you happier with my company and will then in turn you know, increase the, the re- likelihood that you're gonna come back. Paul, so much uh, emphasis right now is on supporting our small businesses, especially in Michigan right now as we're 
going through this shutdown period, this three-week pause, as the Health and Human Services Department and Governor Whitmer refers to it as. Why, why right now is it a good time, potentially, for small businesses to consider what maybe they can do, especially in the retail realm or even in uh, even some maybe even in uh, food industries, what they can do in terms of, of subscription-based products and, yeah. and or content for their consumers, especially while they're limiting how many people can be in their store at a time or when they can have people in their stores and maybe are struggling with the online ordering or the delivery method at this moment. Well, I'll tell you an interesting story that we actually just featured at our, our event sub summit. There's an ice cream shop uh, based just outside of Pittsburgh, I believe, called Cheban. And they were, you know, just similar to here in Michigan, they're in a lockdown situation and they weren't able to you know, serve customers in their store. And they introduced an ice cream subscription. Now it sounds a little challenging to ship and there were some challenging logistics around it. But by doing so, they were able to still service the customers outside of their store. And they had an opportunity for customers to come pick it up in store as well. But it actually, it was really interesting, the interview, when, we, when you uh, watch it, it's out on our YouTube channel. Subscriptions saved their business. And it wasn't just from engaging with customers more and uh, having the opportunity for recurring billing and recurring customers out there. But they also started to learn quickly what flavors people liked and didn't like because they're using it as an opportunity to get rapid feedback as well. So it's really interesting. You can you can take any business and think about the possible subscription models to it, possible membership models. And so, you know, I like to say just just sit back and, and think about what all the different opportunities might be and then narrow it down to where it may be best fit for your business. Paul Chambers with us here on the Oakland County Mega Cast. He's the co-founder and CEO for Subscription Trade Association. I do feel like this world prior, you know, pre-pandemic had already been exploding. And, you know, food services like HelloFresh and some of those industries, and I'm seeing it a lot in the wine industry as well. Do you think the pandemic is actually going to continue to allow this industry to explode and this is going to be something that we live with from here on out? Yeah, absolutely. I think, so the pandemic has definitely accelerated in e-commerce uh, and, and all the data and all the reports will, will show that. Um, and, you know, not only has it adjusted our shopping behavior, it's given us more consumers confidence in purchasing online. Those that may have been on the edge before, like, ah, I'm hesitant to put my credit card online or I'm, I don't, you know, have an account set up over there, so I'm not ready to do that. Now have those accounts set up, are now building the confidence in the e-commerce infrastructure and are more comfortable with, with doing that. And so obviously I'm sure as the world starts to open back up again, and hopefully that's sometime in the near future, people will go back to shopping retail and they'll go back to retail stores. But our expectations at e-commerce will continue to see some, some growth and, and not just completely flatten off because people will have that confidence now. So why would a business join your association? What's the benefit? Yeah, so we offer resources and tools to help them grow their subscription businesses, whether it be through interfacing with other subscription business owners, finding partners and, and resources that will help them, whether they need boxes made or shipping partners or warehousing or payment processors, we help them with that. And then just the community as a whole is so awesome and so supportive. And so, Paul, you had mentioned that you're a firefighter there in the city of Detroit. I'm just looking at this and wondering, like, I know a lot of firefighters, especially in Detroit, and most of them do have second careers and second jobs, but yeah. they typically to be more in the trades industry. How in the world did a firefighter get involved in this side of the industry? So I'll, I'll correct you for a second. I'm a firefighter in Troy, uh, just north of Detroit here in the suburb of Troy. And, and Troy is an entirely volunteer fire department. It's amazing uh, and, and very unusual for this area, of course. Um, but, you know, I love I love helping my community and being part of what I do here. And so I've always been a business owner for since I was in high school. And so I always follow my passion and, and firefighting is a, a fun thing to do as well. So shout out to all the firefighters. I think you mentioned in West Bloomfield that are airing this today. Yeah, we're in West Bloomfield and we have a Tri-City um, Fire Department here that services Kiko Silva and West Bloomfield and um, the local community here. Hey, and quickly before we let you go, how if someone is sitting at home and they're watching or they're listening 
and they're thinking about doing this, how can they find more information? I know you mentioned earlier you have a YouTube page. Mm -hmm. Is there a way for them just to go on to maybe look at the avenues that could be available to them before they take that deep dive? Oh yeah, absolutely. There's tons and tons of content and great resources out there. Like I mentioned, we have a free sub to membership and that's uh, on our website, S-U-B as in boy, T-A dot com, subta dot com. Uh, so they can they can sign up there, get part of the community and, and learn and meet some great people. And if you're interested in starting like a subscription box in particular, uh, that is something you ship out every month. There's two really great websites I point people to that they can look at and see what other subscription boxes exist out there. The first is mysubscriptionaddiction.com. That's mysubscriptionaddiction.com. And the other one's CrateJoy, Crate, C-R-A-T-E, joy.com. And there are big directories of subscription boxes. And so if you're ever curious what exists and what doesn't exist, that's a great place to start. Well, Paul, we so appreciate having you with us and we wish you continued success during this pandemic, but also, you know, we appreciate your insight and your advice to other people that are looking at maybe shifting their careers right now because yeah. the world is a crazy world and why not try to take your career and your future in your own hands? Absolutely. And thanks so much for having me. One more thing I want to show you too. You guys mentioned how uh, ugly holiday sweaters. Check this out, a little wine bottle with an ugly holiday sweater on it. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're talking that about is so holiday. perfect. Yeah, right? Yeah, so all kinds of fun stuff out there. Anyway, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, Paul, I have to tell you, you need to team up with uh, the the team over at UglySweaters.com. They're located in commerce. So yes, between the great. wine and the sweater, it's a perfect combination. I know. It's, it's everything you need for your, your small holiday gathering this year. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for being with us. We so appreciate appreciate your time. We're going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Mega Cast, and when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation about the economy and uh, businesses as well, and making yourself successful during the middle of the pandemic. And we'll be speaking with the founder and executive director for the Michigan Association for Female entrepreneurs. You're listening to and watching the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful, michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, Wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. on the Friday edition of the Oakland County Megapass. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in my home studios. Mr. Tyler Keith holding things down back at our studio in West Bloomfield. Just as a reminder, you can catch us on civiccentertv.com Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon. Birmingham Area Municipal Access and also Channel 15, Comcast Channel 99 on at and We want to give a huge shout out today to the West Bloomfield Fire Department for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast on their Facebook page. So we want to say thank you 
to them. Detroit and the state of Michigan in general was in the middle of seeing great success of women-owned businesses, not just here, but across America over the recent years. And Michigan and Detroit was breaking pretty high on that list for the new growth. However, is that still the case in the middle of the pandemic? And can that growth continue post-pandemic? For more information, let's bring in Tanya McNeil Weary. She's the founder and executive director for the Michigan Association for Female Entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for being up with us. Hi, good morning, and thank you for having me. I love what you all are doing. For those not familiar with your organization, bring us up to speed as to your mission. Yes, so I started Michigan Association for Female Entrepreneurs in 2003 when I had just moved to Detroit from Chicago. So I was new in the city. I didn't know anyone here in Detroit. And there I was starting a business in a new city, um, looking for resources and just looking for other women who I could network and share ideas with. And so what started out as an idea to just bring women together um, as a supportive network turned into a nonprofit organization that has serviced over 1,500 women across the state of Michigan since 2003. I, I love just your story in general. How did you take it as a new person in town to the organization that it is today? Because I think a lot of us have thoughts and ideas, but they stay there in our heads. So how do you get it from a thought into reality? Yeah, so actually for me, I have been an entrepreneur for a while. I was an entrepreneur while I was in Chicago, but more on a small scale. So it's just really having access to the right resources. And that's one of the reasons I founded MAFI, because not only is it important for women to have resources, but knowing where to go to get those resources. And so I wanted to have an organization where we could make sure women all across the state had access to the resources that were available. Um, there's tons of great organizations here in Michigan, in the city of Detroit, that can help you formulate your idea, can help you with funding, help you with mentoring. So I just wanted to make sure that women knew about those resources, because what I found is that a lot of times they just didn't know. Like me, when I first moved here, of course, I didn't know. But when you bring groups of women together and you're sharing ideas and resources, you tend to learn a lot. And it also helps you to formulate your idea just listening to the ideas of others. Yeah, so why reinvent the wheel each and every time? Let's collaborate together. Uh, you know, there may be some guys out there watching us that says, well, what about us? Why support just women businesses? Yeah, well, really entrepreneurs in general, I, I want to be honest, entrepreneurs in general face many, many challenges. But as we all know, women face even more challenges just because of our gender. We have um, less access to funding. Um, we are left out of a lot of conversations. We're not at a lot of those tables where um, decisions are being made. So it's really important to have these types of organizations to support women because we are underrepresented. So knowing that right now we're in the middle of a pandemic, a crisis like our country has never seen before. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to be the impact coming out of this for female entrepreneurs? Is it actually going to spur new businesses or is it taking away from some of those businesses that were just started? Well, I'm saying a little bit of both, but I'm seeing more of new businesses. I'm seeing more women using this, 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 this time that we're in now to create new solutions. So they're coming up with new ideas, new products and new services to solve some of the challenges that we are facing today. So you do see a rise in the number of businesses. Also, what I see is some of those businesses are starting to shift to online businesses and more businesses are going digital. Um, so you see an a, a increase in, in e-commerce and those types of businesses as well. Which is great because we just had the uh, gentleman on 
from the subscription uh, trade association, which really is about digital marketing and digital businesses. So knowing that, and I'm thinking about parents that are at home right now, the ones that are lucky enough to actually even be able to work remotely, but they're also trying to juggle that job and that career while their child is at home trying to learn remotely. So is this and could this be a good time for women to jump into a business that maybe they wanted to start, but didn't want to leave that security of that nine to five? Yeah, it's absolutely a good time. It's always a good time to go into business. So um, definitely the, the work-life balance is probably a lot more challenging for those women who do have ch children at home. So now in addition to you maybe working a nine to five job that is now a work from home, maybe you're, you have a small business on the side, but now you have homeschool as well that's been thrown into the mix of all that. So although there are those challenges, it's still a really great time. There's tons of opportunities uh, for women and especially women working from home. And so this has just made it even more so. Tanya McNeil Weary with us here on the Oakland County Mega Cash. She is the founder and executive director for the Michigan Association for Female Entrepreneurs. And piggybacking off of what you just said about the work-life balance. If someone wants to go it alone and try to start up a new business, one of the good things is maybe they can shift that time frame to after when they need to try to help their kids with homeschooling or they could shift those meetings around. But are some businesses better to start now than others? Um, definitely the digital space right now is where it is where it's at with the shutdown and, and those things that's really impacting those brick and mortar businesses really that digital, that e-commerce, that online is really the place to be. So we're seeing a lot of those businesses who that were not already online have shifted mm -hmm. to digital. We've seen businesses who had to um, pivot you know, what they were doing, maybe they had a brick and mortar, but had to shift to more of an e-commerce platform because of the pandemic. Um, I myself, I, I run a business and, and my business is definitely uh, filling some of that impact as well. Um, but my business is a consultancy. And so it's easier for me in consulting um, to, to shift versus someone with the actual brick and mortar where your business relies on customers coming into that, that business. Top three um, businesses that you would say are going to be here um, post pandemic that you recommend people research and consider getting into. Yeah, definitely the e-learning space is really growing. So a lot of online uh, training um, companies uh, coaching, uh, business coaching services online is really growing. It, you just had a wonderful speaker talk about the subscription box business, which is really huge. And that's something that's really growing. And I've been seeing a lot of that as well. Uh, but if I'm sitting at home and I'm like, oh, I have to pay the light bill. I have to pay my rent. I have to pay my car payment. And I'm thinking about taking that step out. How do you get over the fear to make it a reality? Yeah, I think being part of organizations such as Michigan Association for Female Entrepreneurs, and there's other great organizations out there as well. But when you are a part of those organizations and you're talking to people that are in the same situation, they have the same fears, they have the same challenges. I think it makes it a lot easier because then you know that you're not in it alone. You're not by yourself. And it's also helpful to share ideas, to network, to make those connections. Um, so, so really, that's really what it's about. It's about building your network, connecting with organizations such as MAFI and other great organizations where you can connect with other women who, like you, may have that same challenge or have those fears as well. One of the things that's hard right now, networking. Uh, business is all about networking. And there's nothing like that in-person interaction and those organic conversations. And sometimes, too, those organic meetings that come out of um, some of the trade associations, uh, you know, seminars and weekend conferences and things of that nature. But that world has changed now. 
how are you guys addressing that itch issue? I know you have a conference coming up. Yeah. I would imagine it's going to be virtual. Yes, so we have, and I'm so glad that you mentioned it. Um, we have our Women Entrepreneurs Conference, which is taking place actually tomorrow. This is an annual conference that has been going on now, and we are in our eighth year. And in eight years, this is our first time ever going digital. So this will be the first time the conference will be online. So there is, you know, that shift to uh, from that in-person where you're actually connecting and shaking hands and making that, that personal connection face-to-face -to, -face, to now we have this online platform and bringing that same experience online to the attendees is what we're trying to do. So this has been a, a learning process for all of us. And knowing that, Tanya, how is that working? How did you have to rethink how you do a conference so that people, number one, attend, and number two, actually get what they need to get out of it. Yeah, so definitely um, at first, and I, and I will be honest and say, when we made the shift to all of our meetings being online, it was, it was okay, it was fun, it was still a way to keep engaged and, and to connect. So it was like the next best thing. Now that we're in, I don't know what month this is, but now everybody's getting to the point to where it's like, okay, enough of these online events. You know, we're getting kind of zoomed out, you know, in a sense. And so how do you, how do you take that and make it that experience that people can really enjoy after they have gotten so burned out with the online events. I think at first we were all just so excited that we can still have this way of connecting and engaging. And then like after that hundredth meeting, it's like, okay, I'm ready to get back in person. <laughs> So, but I think we've done a really good job. We've added some um, really great elements to our online conference, which is taking place tomorrow, the uh, Women Entrepreneurs Conference. We have um, a virtual networking lounge where you can actually meet and connect. You can video call those people that you wanna connect with. You have that one-to-one, -one, three minute session networking that you can do virtually online and you can see each other. So that's really great. We also have a virtual coaching lab where you can connect with uh, expert business coaches that can help you in very uh, various areas of your business. We have virtual expo booths, so that's going to be really exciting. So really trying to take what we've done in person and create that same experience online. Although I will say the one thing about virtual is you don't come home with all the swag. <laughs> But I will say, <laughs> typically the swag is the little stuff that you throw out anyway once you get home. But once you're going booth to booth, you're like, I need that. I need that. How many yeah. stress balls does an individual need? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what we've tried to do is get really creative. And so we do have digital swag. So now you're going to have all of these downloadable things that you can take with you away from the conference. And I do want to say thanks to our um, official event sponsors who helped to make this possible. And that is Facebook. Uh, Facebook has given us some digital swag. So we have attendees that will be actually getting um, uh, Facebook ad credits. We have Google as well as one of our official event partners and so want to thank want to thank them as well they've been a part of our conference for the last two three years and so when we made the shift to digital they uh, still wanted to support and be part of the event so I want to say thanks to them and, you know and that's great and, and in all honesty <laughs> if you're a business person it seems like that swag that you can walk <laughs> away from this conference and actually utilize Yes, absolutely. A lot of great tips, a lot of downloadable books, and a lot of great things that women uh, could take away with them and actually apply and implement in their business Im immediately. And so you mentioned that the conference is actually going to be taking place tomorrow. Can people still sign up? Absolutely. Registration is still available. And the great thing, the best part of all is that registration is free. So you can actually go to our website, which is www.mafedetroit, that's M-A-F-E, Detroit.org, and you can sign up for free. You know, before we let you go, just a couple more minutes with you here on the Oakland County Megacast. Before we let you go, what words of advice do you have to women out there who are considering taking this huge leap of faith and joining um you know the independent entrepreneurial world yeah i would definitely say go for it 
definitely pursue your passion, pursue your dream, but don't go at it alone. Connect with organizations such as Matthew. You don't have to be in this by yourself. As we all know, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship can already be a lonely space, right? And now that we're under the pandemic and people are at home by themselves and you don't have that face-to-face -face interaction, it's even more lonelier. So we don't want women to think that they are by themselves. But organizations like Matthew is here. I would encourage them to get involved with our organization. We have a very supportive group of entrepreneurs that can help and support them along the way. We do have a Facebook page that they can interact and engage with. We're on LinkedIn, uh, we're on Instagram, and we're on Twitter. I would just say to definitely go for it, and but don't go at it alone and don't think that they're by themselves. And so quickly before we let you go, you just mentioned about social media. How important has social media been for your organization and other women in the business world to, to connect them during the pandemic, which can be a time of isolation? Absolutely. I think social media has been wonderful. It's definitely a way to stay engaged and to stay involved because it can get quite lonely. I don't know where I would be right now without social media if I didn't have, you know, my Facebook friends and my LinkedIn connections that I can still engage and interact with. If I was just sitting at home and just looking at the walls, I think I would be crazy by now. So it's really a great tool to utilize that and to leverage that tool to really build on your connections because we will be together again hopefully soon and so by that time you will have already built up your, your your network and your circle of influence that now you can meet face to face and you know and you mentioned LinkedIn um, I, I think I was reading a study once uh, when you're looking for a new job or you're trying to reach out LinkedIn is such a vital key component component but I will say I'm not much of a LinkedIn person. I have an account, but I don't engage. What advice do you have for people to utilize the platforms that are out there? Which are the best ones for connecting in the business world? Yeah, and so that for that question, it really depends on the type of business you're in and who your customers are. You have to go where your customers are. I think if you try to be on all platforms, you would just go nuts. I would say to really just take those platforms where your customers are and focus on those customers. So for some people that's in, you know, the retail space, um, you know, Pinterest, you know, if you have things to demonstrate and show, you know, you definitely want to be on YouTube if you're doing demonstrations and, and, and videos. So it just really depends on the individual business and where your customers are. For my personal business outside of Mappy, I do run a global management consulting firm. And so for me, my customers are more on, my clients are more on LinkedIn. So that's where my clients are. So you have to go where your where your customers are. If it's Twitter, if it's Facebook, if it's LinkedIn, if it's Pinterest, if it's YouTube, focus on that platform where you're most likely to reach your target audience. Tanya McNeil Weary with us here on the Oakland County Mega Cash. She is the founder and executive director for the Michigan Association for female entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for not only being with <laughs> us here today, but also uh, thank you for what you're doing to promote women in business because being a female does offer uh, different challenges in the business world. And I think it's so great that we have organizations such as yours to reach out and connect one, of the, one another to not only promote and grow our business, but also so we don't feel so alone, especially right now during the COVID-19 crisis and, and a pandemic where so many people can feel so isolated so thank you so much for what you do and um, we're wishing you the best of luck quickly again can you before we let you go can you let people know again how they can sign up for tomorrow's conference if they want to still join Yes, so the easiest way is through our website. It'll take you to the events link, and that is www.mafedetroit. That's M as in Michigan, afedetroit.org. And they can also find out about membership while they're there as well. Great. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. We're going to take a quick break here on Thank the you. Oakland County Megacast. When we come back, still a lot to get to. In the second hour of the Oakland County Megacast, and when we come back, 
we will be shifting the conversation just a little bit and bringing in the Chief Health Officer and Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Michigan, a very important conversation as we are just one week out from Thanksgiving when so many people gather uh, Thanksgiving, the concern there is, is it going to be a super spreader? So a lot to get to in the next hour of the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so. Those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, Talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith, alongside Ronnie Dahl. You are watching and listening to us on Civic Center TV and on Birmingham Area Municipal Access. In addition, as always, we are on 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, West Bloomfield, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and on 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills, 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, Hit Music, Hot Topics, Sports Talk. Also today, we are on the Facebook page via Facebook Live with the West Bloomfield Fire Department. I'd like to thank their team, Greg Flynn and everybody, the chief over there, and all the firefighters uh, and paramedics on the front lines continuing to battle the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm also joined from her home studio by Ronnie Dahl, as I am each and every day here on the Oakland County Megacast. Ronnie, you are muted. Look at that. There I didn't we even go. do anything. How are you, Tyler? I'm hey, fine. I mute myself Friday. sometimes, too. It is Friday. It's great. It's exciting. I'm happy about it. It is. Beautiful day. It too. is. Friday, as a matter of fact, uh, temperatures are going to be uh, around 60 today, but then the weather is going to be changing. Hopefully, you are going to be able to get out and enjoy the weather before it starts to feel a lot more like fall over the next week or so. Because one thing during the winter months and the colder months, it is forcing us indoors right now. And in the past week, Michigan has raked six nationally for the highest number of cases and fifth for the most deaths, according to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and the Prevention Tracker. The latest additions bring the state's total of confirmed cases of COVID-19 to a staggering number of 285,398 cases. 8,300 people have died since the virus was first detected in Michigan in March. And so many people right now are feeling pandemic fatigue. However, this virus is still with us. We wanna go ahead now and join us on the conversation about COVID-19 and this deadly pandemic is Dr. Preeti Malani. She is the health officer and professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Michigan. So great to have you with us on the Oakland County Megacast, Dr. Thank you, Ronnie. Let's just start off. We are 
just a few days out from Thanksgiving, CDC putting out a very alarming alert yesterday, encouraging so many people and not to travel home. You're at the University of Michigan. I believe you have a college student. What should parents know? Should their kids come home? Should they keep them on campus? And we're a few days out. So these could be hard decisions for some parents to make, especially if their child isn't within driving distance. Yeah, so Ronnie, these are like, the, the decisions are, are difficult and they're certainly difficult for my family even with uh, with my my son is a student at the University of Michigan and you know just in general like that the holidays are this time where we want to get together with our friends and our neighbors and of course our extended families and this year has to be a little bit different you noted the CDC's uh, comments earlier this week which are pretty extraordinary but basically saying don't travel and don't gather especially outside of your own household and and again I say this is that each family really needs to make careful decisions on how to celebrate safely because there's an uninvited guest this year and that's uh, that's COVID-19. And these small household gatherings have been an important contributor to the to the surge we're seeing. And it's been, you, you mentioned the Michigan numbers and they've been, it's astounding, a, a million cases in the, in the country, new diagnoses in the past seven days. Um, I can tell you a little bit about what we're doing on campus. And, and again, this is a stepwise process and what we've asked you know, our campus is a, it's, it's a little bit different depending on what year you are. And most of the students living in the residence halls are our first year students. And of course we have graduate students and international students who are gonna stay put and this is home for them. But the traditional, the ones that graduated last year during the pandemic and entered school during a very imperfect time, uh, these are the ones that, that we're thinking about. And today it sort of marks the day of when uh, the residence halls are sort of closing up this weekend. and. We've asked them to practice uh, enhanced social distancing, so being really careful about their contacts for the last couple of weeks, and then to get departure testing, and which uh, is being done for free on campus. And again, testing is, is one element. It's not a guarantee, it's not an absolute, but we don't want to send people home to their home communities with active infection. And then when they get home, to quarantine further. And again, that sounds sort of extraordinary, but we're living in extraordinary times. And I wonder if we could talk about the testing for a moment because, you know, so many labs are getting backed up right, right now because of the testing. So you're hearing conflicting information right now. Some people are saying if you don't have symptoms, don't get tested. But yet other people are saying, no, if you're going home or if you're going to travel, get tested. But we also know that test is a snapshot in time. How do you make these decisions with so many different, you know, it, it, so much different information is coming at you? Yeah, and it's, you know, it's complicated for me. And this is like what I think about really for far too many hours each day. So I can see where it's confusing to folks. So I will just say, if you have symptoms or you've had an exposure, you fall into a very different bucket. And testing there is uh, something that's recommended and it's treated a little bit differently. Uh, but what you're talking about is testing without symptoms, so asymptomatic testing. And again, I think for students leaving a college campus where rates are higher and exposure is higher, and you know, I, on our campus, actually, things have gotten a lot better in the past couple of weeks. We were in a, 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 a different place uh, back in October, and fortunately, numbers have come down. But as we're sending our students back to their permanent residence, to their families, uh, potentially to vulnerable family members, we want to make sure that we're doing our very best to at least prevent that's it's like one more safeguard i would say um and again campus is is a, is a different situation and particularly living in a residence hall for those of us who have been following pretty good practices and we're at home and we're just we're worried uh, you certainly could get tested right now that that access is is a little bit limited because so much testing capacity is going toward people who've been exposed or even have symptoms um, it, testing is something that is evolving and we have more access, but there's still not enough. And I, I was just hearing this morning that some of the area hospitals are again having supply issues. But I want to emphasize something that I see done, which is that people get tested thinking that they can go to a party or to a family gathering and, and be, quote, like clean, uninfected. And that is not the case. Uh, when you're mixing with someone outside your household, that 
you still need to follow the guidance of distancing and masks. And I know that seems odd for families, but this is an odd time. And this is about really preventing those devastating infections. And, and again, there's not one perfect way. And that's why the recommendation is to maybe celebrate virtually this year. Yeah, you know, when we think about, I know the CDC is saying, if you're going to have some type of Thanksgiving gathering, do it outside. That's great if you live in Florida, but we are in Michigan and next week, I think the forecast is calling for 40 degree weather. Um, realistically, people are not going to be doing that. And so what do you do if you um, are feeling pressure from your family to attend a, an event? Um, because I think that is part of this conversation that no one's really having right now is that how do you kind of contain that backlash from your family if you say, hey, I'm not comfortable coming right now? Yeah, you know, those, that's, Ronnie, that's a really good point. And it is. I, I was born and raised in Michigan. And, you know, Thanksgiving is usually, um, especially people who've gone to Detroit for the parade traditionally, or the turkey trot, it is, it is always cold. And actually, this year's a little warmer than most. But I agree, you know, this isn't the summertime where you could be outside, but you know, you could be in your garage, you could open windows, um, you can do some things, you can eat separately. So I have a couple thoughts on this. One is that those family conversations, really have them ahead of time. And I know they feel a little unnatural and awkward, but really the lives of the people you love depend on them. Your own life might depend on it. So have those conversations, let folks know. I, I actually think people are reasonable um, and you know, we just don't know how to how to go about this. And I've heard all kinds of things from friends in the last couple of weeks and, you know, I, do, do the right thing and make good decisions. I will say too, that if you do gather in small numbers, some of the things you can do is keep the masks on and really try to eat and drink separately. Maybe eat and drink on your own and then get together to, um, to just get together. Because the, the danger is when the masks are off and you're in close contact. And there are ways to try to prevent that you know, maybe to to uh, eat in separate rooms. And again, none of this is normal or natural or ideal, but this is about what we need to do at this point to prevent spread because those small family gatherings have really contributed to the surge that we're seeing right now. Can we shift a little bit to the conversation about the vaccines? I think once we have all heard this, general public people, we hear vaccine and we think, oh, we're gonna be able to get back to life as we once knew it. Um, your thoughts on the vaccine and is a regular life down the normal or is COVID going to be around from here on out? You know, those are, those are uh, million dollar questions. I, I guess there's good news with the vaccine and uh, we've, we've heard early data from uh, Moderna and Pfizer. And these are the mRNA, it's one particular platform, but the other vaccines that are still under study you know, that are in the late phase trials, uh, use a similar uh, part of the virus to create the antibody response. So I guess this is encouraging all along that hopefully there'll be multiple effective vaccines. The safety data are also reported to be very good. And I understand that Pfizer is going to the FDA today with their data, with the hopes of getting an emergency use authorization. And, you know, that could happen as soon as a few weeks. So we could we're actually planning at the University of Michigan the health system uh, in anticipation of having vaccine as soon as December and how that's going to look because we've never had to vaccinate this many people in, in the country and certainly not during a pandemic. So uh, excitement and uh, lots to look forward to, but more information is still pending. In terms of where we're going to go with the vaccine, the vaccine again will be one element and I like to emphasize this, that, that isn't going to be a, a moment of like, wow, the vaccine's here and now we're all back to normal. It's going to be a staged process. Now, I do think that Operation Warp Speed and all the resources of the federal government have put us in a good place where the manufacturers have gone ahead and made doses, millions of doses, hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine and, and started with planning on how this is going to be distributed. Uh, my hope is that if we can contain the virus in the community, and this is why we can't just have out of control spread. There's lots of reasons, but this is one of them. We could eventually with the vaccine get closer to normal. And my hope is, is that sometime in 2021, maybe at the beginning of the school year, hopefully things will look closer to normal, but it's really gonna depend on the basic mitigation factors until then.
Dr. Pretty Milani Dr. with us on the Oakland County Megacast. She is a she's a chief health officer and the pr- professor of medicine in the division of the infectious diseases at the University of Michigan. Dr. Milani, with that being the case, uh, with, with the timetable that's associated with distributing the vaccine after that timetable has surpassed and the vaccine has been out in the out in the public and the general public is starting to get vaccinated and we're seeing that finish line where is the finish line after people have been vaccinated what are what is the medical community looking at what will the government be looking at also from the medical community and the scientific community after a vaccine is distributed to be that benchmark, if there is a benchmark or a set of benchmarks that say, okay, now we're in a position where we have mostly contained the virus. It's not going to be as contagious necessarily or dangerously contagious further because of the vaccine and the effects of that on the general population. Where is that benchmark and, and what, how long do you think after this vaccine is distributed that, we should, that people should expect that timetable to last? Yeah, these are great questions, and I, I ask these questions every day to myself and, and to others around me. Um, you know, so I think there's there's reason for hope, and I, I want to leave people with with hope because this has been such a hard year, and uh, this is going to be a difficult holiday season for for families. Uh, the fact that the vaccine efficacy numbers are so high means like the ability to prevent cases is uh, in the 90, 95 percent range. It means that we're likely to have um, a higher likelihood that we can actually get rid of this and, and have it to where the numbers are so small that it won't Im- impair our, our day-to-day living. Now, getting to that point is gonna take a while, um, but but I am hopeful as to where that finish line is and what that looks like, a lot of unknowns, including the fact that we don't really understand, does the, does the vaccine completely prevent disease or does it prevent um, transmission? Do you get like a low level? Of infection, there's still a lot of unknowns that we we need to work out. Um, but I I do think that finish line is there, but it's not going to look quite like uh, what we think of a finish line. It's going to be sort of a slow stage process, and we also have to remember that um, you know some some people may not feel comfortable getting the vaccine, and so having good information, having honest communication, uh, especially around the approval process, like what happened. How did it happen? So that people feel good about the, good about this vaccine. Yeah, I also wonder because obviously we have the vaccine for the flu, but you know the strain of the flu changes every day, and you wonder is this going to happen with COVID nineteen as well? But also going forward, when we're looking at the ethical side, are companies or businesses now going to require? for people to have proof of, uh, of a vaccine in order to maybe work or go to a sporting event, things of that nature. Well, what are your thoughts on the possibility of that down the road? Yeah, that's those are those are unknowns. And I think that probably the, some of the easy ones are if you work in the hospital, likely you will require be required to be vaccinated with very few reasons for exceptions. And frankly, that's the case with the flu vaccine, which uptake overall in the community is lower. Uh, I think residence halls, for example, thinking back to college campuses, um, military barracks, other places where you live in very close contacts uh, with people, these are going to be the places where you really want to have high rates of vaccination schools, uh, classrooms. So, you know, my hope is, is that we get good information out and that people uh, take it at face value and, and ask the right questions. And frankly, everything that has been provided to date is really encouraging. Um, I do know that the vaccine, when you first get it, the ones that have been talked about in the last few weeks, there are some side effects and people have fevers for a couple of days and their arm hurts, but that's short lived. And again, we're comparing the risk of the vaccine and the side effects and inconvenience uh, to getting COVID and potentially being left with uh, with illness for weeks. And obviously, you know, the severe cases, hospitalization and even, even death. So it's a trade off, but that, communication piece and it's going to be from the news media it's going to be from from healthcare workers it's going to be from vaccine manufacturers the government everyone to really be clear and to address the concerns people have because people are going to have concerns about a a new experimental vaccine that was rushed in their view from a healthcare standpoint i think 
one of the good things that maybe will come out of this was how the scientific community came together to collaborate on so many various different levels globally to try to come up with this vaccine. Do you think some of that will fall over into what we hope to be a post-pandemic time to help with um, vaccines for other diseases as well? Yeah, I hope so, Ronnie. This is this is there are silver linings, and I think the collaboration, including the the private public collaboration in this case, the the entire weight of the federal government helping to move things quickly. You know that was necessary. The manufacturers have also been all in. There are a lot of smart, thoughtful, altruistic people who've been working on this like since day one. Uh, I do hope that we can think about not just vaccines, but prevention in general and public health in general. Uh, we've been so focused on COVID, but there are a lot of other issues for our health and whether it's heart disease or cancer prevention or it's loneliness and social isolation. And I think shining a bright light on our overall health because we're not a healthy community uh, in, in, in all senses. And so I, hope that uh, science moves forward. I hope I hope young people are interested in science and especially public health. And I hope that that spirit of collaboration does continue. And knowing that and knowing your background, how worried that COVID is just one virus, there could be another one that comes after this. That is the worry. And uh, one pandemic is, is one too many, but we need to be prepared with the next threat. And, and not have this ever happen again. But we, we do need to have monitoring systems and to really rethink how we do things. And again, I think the, the public health people who are truly heroes with the, the work they've been doing with very limited resources, I hope that we can think about how to better fund and support and resource those, those lifelines. Doctor, uh, before we let you go, as someone who studies infectious diseases, looking at this new generation and the college students right now, they're having to learn remotely and it's a different world. But yet, are you hoping that this crisis and the, this pandemic will spur interest in the healthcare industry so that um, we have more people ready to, to go on those front lines and be a part of the solution in the future. Yeah, I hope so. I hope that that is one of the silver linings. And again, health, health sciences are great. And whether it's in social work or in nursing or in pharmacy, or certainly medical, dental, whatever it is that you choose to do, you know, to, to think about science and the beauty of science. Uh, I've had a pretty untraditional career and uh, I think it's, but, but it's, but it, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, you know, this is not a time that I would ever want to live in, but it's been, there, there are silver linings. And I think for our young people, science is, is great and exciting and whether, however you choose to come at it, there is a place for you. So before we let you go, just another minute or two, anything we maybe didn't touch on uh, that you want to share with our listeners and our viewers, because when it comes to this pandemic and it comes to science, you are the expert. We're basically going off of the news headlines. And I wonder what it's like for people such as yourself with so much more knowledge than us in the general public, what it's like for you to go through this as well. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting and it's I think it's been exhausting, but also uh, exhilarating. And, and I, I think there's a real sense of gratitude for people. Um, what I would say is that um, the end, this isn't gonna last forever. We are gonna get better. So you know, take care of each other, be kind, be patient. Um, I think it's hard, we're all kind of raw from this. The other thing I would say, and I know that you know recently, and I'm sure you've talked about it, the, the, uh, the, the pause to save lives, that we have to remember that the economy really depends on the virus being under control. We can't have one or the other. It's not a false choice of like, let's just do things as usual and forget the virus because frankly, people aren't comfortable being out and about if there's uncontrolled spread, but we can be in the middle. Like the two extremes are, are extremes. And what I want is for people to try to be in the middle, to try to reframe and to continue and find ways to continue to move forward, whether it's with work or school or with your social life and to really be nice to each other and be civil and kind and really think about how much people are hurting right now. Um, and I think Michiganders, we're, we're like strong, robust people. Like we're gonna get through this winter and hopefully there's gonna be um, a, a new start in the spring. 
and Doctor, with that, one of the things I wonder um, is, so when the government does it, so like now we're in the middle of this three week pause, as they like to call it, but what happens at the end of the three weeks? If people go out and continue to live like they were prior, won't we be right back in the same cycle? Yes, unfortunately we will. I, I think that that is um, a concern. And so I think somehow explaining the why without it becoming this false choice between, you know, this is this is a political choice or freedom or, or that this is, you know, um, unfair. All of it's unfair. And this has been about difficult choices. But again, there can be no economy. There can be no society if, if we have people that are getting sick and dying. And again, we focus a lot on deaths and hospitalizations, and those are really important numbers. Unfortunately, we've been a little bit better than we have in the spring, but we also see people who get mild illness, who are young and healthy and who are sick for weeks on end. This isn't something that anyone wants. You know, many people have recovered, thankfully, but I think the idea is wearing a mask can actually produce incredible benefits to people. And again, just not being in big crowded places, sort of mitigating ourselves and finding places to live, uh, finding a, you know, a way to live that still allows you to have that important social interaction and allows businesses to continue. And, and I think finding ways to support each other through this. This is, none of this is ideal. We had heard earlier on about some of the college students basically having parties to try to get it so they could say, hey, I've already had it, I'm immune. And we are seeing so many more people, record numbers being tested and testing positive. Once an individual has the virus, what do you want them to know about once they're on that second edge of it, they come out and they're back to normal life, can they still catch it and can they still spread it? Now, these are good questions and there's still some unknowns in terms of what immunity means. And there have been descriptions of people getting infected again. Uh, fortunately, it appears to be rare, but the rules are the same for you at this point. And that may change as we learn more. But right now, uh, having infection doesn't mean you get to behave any differently. And you know those, those stories about the college students trying to get infected, I, I you know I, that may be the case. I think those are really a very small number. I think some of those stories were exaggerated. But you know it's hard. Young people want to be with other young people. People want to be together. And I have also seen a lot of really responsible behavior with small groups kind of people finding their social pod because being completely isolated carries a lot of risk too. And so again, it gets back to this idea of being in the middle and trying to moderate our behavior and finding ways to reframe interaction and move forward, but doing so safely. Well, we so appreciate your time as well as your knowledge. Um, here on the Oakland County Megacast. We're wishing you and your family a safe and very happy Thanksgiving as well. And again, um, we so appreciate your time. Thank you for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Thanks, likewise to all of you. Happy Thanksgiving, people stay safe. Thank you, Tyler. This is one of the reasons we do this show is to have people such as Dr. Milani here with us on the Oakland County Megacast hearing firsthand from those with so much more knowledge and expertise than all of us about this pandemic and to inform us as well. So great to hear from her. Absolutely. We're gonna take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. And when we come back, the election, the election is over, but it's not really over. We are going to be bringing in Lisa Brown. She's the Oakland County Clerk of Register of Deeds. So much to talk about with her when the Oakland County Megacast returns. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. 
Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. minutes left here in the Friday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We want to remind you, you can catch us Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon. Uh, Tyler Keith and I on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Channel 15 on Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. And also, if you're out driving around, you can catch us on your radio as well. 88.1 FM, the BIP, 89.3 Lakes FM. And today we want to say thank you to the West Bloomfield Fire Department for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast on their Facebook page. So thank you to them and their entire team and we're wishing they continue to stay safe and stay healthy in the middle of the pandemic as they are on the front lines. And another person that has been on the front lines of this crazy election cycle has been Lisa Brown. She's the Oakland County Clerk Register of Deeds. Thank you for being with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Thanks for having me. Are you getting any rest? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I know, you know, people who have voted, if that was their role in the election, you know, they go, oh, it's done. But, uh, you know, on the backside, still have work to do here. So not, not can, getting sleep yet. <laughs> and if we could talk about that, because I will say, I think what's going on in Wayne County right now is shining a light to the entire process. So for so many of us that are just regular people, we, you know, go in, we cast our ballot. That is when the real work starts for so many people on the back end. What is the process? at the well, end of election yeah. day. The, the work on the, uh, behind the scenes starts way before that, but there's a lot that goes into just getting ready for election day. And like the precincts, that's under the purview of, of your local clerk, your city or township clerk. There's things that are done at the county level and there's just a lot of work that goes into an election. Uh, but um, once election day arrives, yes, then of course, things really go into high action and um, absentee ballots are, um, you know, they, they were started to count on election day um, and, you know, that day plays out. Once the polls close, once every voter has cast their ballot, if they were in line by 8 p.m. and all that, um, then there's a lot of work on our side. Yes, I know everybody sits there and waits for the results, uh, but there's a lot that goes into that, including after the results are in, if anyone ever goes to like my website and they'll see unofficial results and it'll say that for about two weeks after a November election. And that's because the um, results aren't official until they have been canvassed. And yeah, you saw um, we had some drama in, in Wayne County with that as well, um, unfortunately, but um, it's a process where every precinct has gone through. So the board of canvassers are chosen by um, the county board of commissioners. And there are two Democrats and two Republicans, but they, they're not there in a partisan way. Um, they're there really just, you know, we had one observer say, oh, it's like an accounting. So I think that was a pretty good description, but there's a long chest checklist that's gone through for every single precinct to just uh, checks and balances, another check and balance that we do, uh, but making sure that things balance, meaning the number of voters, um, matches the number of ballots that were cast and counted on election day. But there's a whole long list of other things that are um, 
that are gone through as well for each precinct. And then after all that, once the canvases are all done, then they sign off and I'm the clerk to the board of canvassers. So I also sign off on certifying the election. So once that's all done, then, then when you go to my website to look at election results, it will say official results. And for me, after all that and signing all that, I also signed certificates of election for everyone who won. So in Oakland County, we've had hundreds of candidates, you know, people who run from library board, state representative, you know, it's it's the gamut. So I'm signing certificates for all those folks. So there's still, and of course our state board of uh, canvassers meet um, next week. So that once that's done, I think we can feel a little bit more solid in, in where we are. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, this is not a new process it's been around forever but when you have a race such as what we've had this year i think for people they don't understand like what are the qualifications for someone to be on the board of canvassers how do you get chosen is it if you're a member of a party how does that happen um, well, that's a great question. I, people don't usually ask that. And people really have not taken an interest in the canvas before. And I, I welcome um, that we had observers and I'm glad we had observers for people to learn what, what it is that goes into the whole process. Um, unfortunately, some of the, the, the observers thought they were gonna be canvassing the election themselves or I, they thought they were gonna see ballots being counted, but, um, but that's, that's part of the learning process. So. But uh, the canvassers, um, they have a four-year term, so they rotate. So every two years, it's a different one, a different Democrat and a different Republican that are up. And the uh, the county party chair for each of those two parties um, uh, suggests three people. They give a list of three people um, from their party to um, be voted on by the commissioners. And it's the whole board that votes. It's not just that party votes for their you know, their candidate or anything like that, or their um, canvasser. And that's it. And I, you know, it's it's been interesting since I've been in this position and, and gone through a few of these elections because, um, you know, some people would be limited. Like you're saying, what are the qualifications? Well, it's not so much what are the qualifications as what don't we want? What, what don't we want from a canvasser? And what we don't want from a canvasser is someone who like is working on someone's campaign because like I often help with the canvas. I go down and I canvas, but being on the ballot, I, I don't touch it. So if somebody has been working on a campaign, we, you know, they wouldn't be able to touch that municipality or if it was countywide, they wouldn't be able to help either. So, um, but it's up to the party chairs as to what names they bring forth to the um, board of commissioners. I, I think the entire process has been fascinating. And I think if anything comes out of this crazy election, it is that the general public has become more aware of the process. It's not as simple as you going in and, you know, casting your ballot. There's so much more that goes into this entire process. And with that, we saw a record number of people with mail-in ballots here in the state of Michigan. I know other states have been doing it for years, but one thing that I'm hearing coming out of it is a lot of people are confused. What is the difference between a mail-in and an absentee ballot. And is there really a difference at all? No, there's not a difference. There's not a difference. Um, they're the same thing. Um, I, they're, you know, it's just different words for the same thing. What I call different is early voting um, because there are states that have early voting. And that is that when you vote, when you fill out your ballot before election day, that you're actually putting it in a tabulator. It's being tabulated before election day. Michigan, we don't have that. You're no ballots are tabulated until election day. So that's where I, I find, I know that other people have said we have early voting in Michigan. I think it's confusing to people. I know I've got, I received phone calls and emails. Where can I go vote now? And you can fill out an absentee ballot now and, and return it to your local clerk, but you know, it won't be put in the tabulator. So, but mail-in vote, absentee vote, they're the same thing. So the certification process is the same. Because I think that's the confusing people are saying, well, oh. if I go and I'm absentee, then they're verifying I am who I am. Whereas a mail-in, because we did have cases where maybe you got the application for the person who lived at your house prior to you. 
Mm-hmm. And while it is a felony to it fill out sure a for someone sure else, is. right? <laughs> uh, it's also kind of hard to track that process. And we had situations in Detroit where maybe a dead person voted, but in, in that case, it, it wasn't that the dead person, it was an issue of like a father son with the same name type thing. And one filled out. So what is the process to try to clean up the voter registration rolls? Is there something maybe like, should this process be changed so that maybe if you haven't voted in five years, you have to re-register or something so that we can make sure that the rolls are cleaned up? Mm-hmm. So, well, um, oh, no, I forgot what I was going to say for the, the first, with what you started with the question. Um, oh, if you do mail in your ballot, but your signature is being checked. Um, your ballot isn't just like accepted if you mail it in. Um, your local clerk is, or staff, they're comparing that signature. And that's why like every time I spoke anywhere, it was like, make sure you sign that outer envelope. If you don't sign that outer envelope, your ballot isn't gonna be counted. But not only that, like if you broke your arm and your signature was different, you know, that, that would be an issue too. So. Um, And we did have a case and not in Oakland County, this election, but um, in Canton where a father like forged his daughter's name. Well, you know, local clerk checked and saw this is not a signature match. Um, And so there it is being checked. It's not just that your ID. Yes. When you go to vote and remember, you're not required to have an ID when you go vote in your precinct. If you don't have an ID, you have to sign an affidavit of identity which again, lying on that is also a crime. So a um, lot, lot of ways to, to break the law if you're trying to cheat in an election but um, and commit fraud. So um, there, is, there is a check in place if you mail in your ballot. That signature is checked. Um, and if it doesn't match, you know, your local clerk is required to, that was a new legislation, to reach out to you so that you can try and remedy that situation, remedy your your signature for proof. No, that is my signature. I'm sorry, my arm's in a cast. So that's why it looked funny or I had to sign it with my left hand or whatever it is. Um, As far as the voter rolls, um, there already is something in place that uh, it's in the law that if um, you haven't voted in, I think it's two federal elections, something like that, your local clerk is supposed to mail out um, a postcard to you to say, hey, I want to make sure you still live here. And so, you know, you still want to be a registered voter, that sort of thing. And, you know, sometimes those postcards will just come back because that person doesn't live there anymore. So then the local clerk is, you know, to take that person off the voting rolls. Um, but, you know, there's some people who who get it and kind of ignore it too and don't respond. Um, or don't, aren't proactive, like, oh, I got married, let me let my clerk know I'm now, you know, my my last name is different, so cross me off with my maiden name and now have me with my married name. So I'm not registered as two people, sort of a thing. So, um, but there are processes in place to to do that. And as far as like deaths, um, I know some of our local cl- clerks, they watch the, um, they look at the obits to update their records. We send death records to local clerks so they can get um, people off. There is a, you know, there, um, there can be a window of time, I guess, and I think that happened um, in another county where um, I, the local clerk wasn't checking the obituaries and everything, and somebody voted, and then they died before election day. So, um, you know, there's a lot to keep up with, but there's ways to know. You just it's just a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I will say, uh, you know, when I got married it wasn't on my mind to go and say, hey, I got married. I have a new legal name now. You know, you're more worried about can, how do I travel internationally with my old passport versus my new passport? And, you know, things are so much stricter now. So these are one of those things, maybe it's a public education, um, you know, platform that needs to be spread out so that we can make sure people are saying, hey, this is my responsibility, or if I do move, uh, because I guarantee you a lot of people that move from maybe one district to another or to another state, I move multiple times, especially in my 20s. Never once did it ever cross my mind to send a notice to the clerk of court and say, hey, I'm not going to be in your district to vote anymore. So, you know, a lot of it, it's just public education and a responsibility on our parts as citizens as well. Yes. 
So but if um, now if you do like if, if you move in Michigan, if you're if you're moving within Michigan and you're changing your driver's license, it, that's automatically going to update your voter registration. So um, so th there's that scenario. It's not just every time you move, you have to take care of it when you're when you're conducting uh, business with the Secretary of State's office, that's going to now it used to be an opt out. Now it's an opt no, it used to be an opt in. Now it's an opt out, whichever one. But anyway, so there are the you know processes are always being changed and updated to make it easier for people and um, less onerous. And um, um, so that scenario, like you said, if you if you're moving within Michigan, that's automatically going to be updated for you when you change your driver's license. How happy that you are in Oakland County right now and not Wayne County and the national attention that is being put on the election in Wayne County. Um, you know, I, I feel bad for Wayne County. Um, it's, it's a lot. I mean, we, we, it, it wasn't like everything ran per, it went perfectly here, but, um, you know, we, we got to avoid a lot of the national attention that, that they received, unfortunately. Um, but you know, again, I think the more people you have observing and learning about the process is a plus. And there are things that you know can be um, improved upon. So um, I think I think it's all good. I think it's all good. I, I want, my takeaway is I want people to understand the process and know that there are so many checks and balances in place um, to ensure that our elections are accurate and secure and fair. And that, like I said, any canvas you can come and watch after, you know, every election, it's open to the public um, and, you know, learn because there was so many and I still get emails. I'm still even though the election's over, I'm getting emails from people just with false information. Just just they're just completely I don't know where they're getting the information, but it is completely wrong. And, um, you know, be, people shouldn't hesitate to reach out to their to either to my office or to their local clerk to ask a question, because if you're he seeing it on social media, please check the source. I, learn from the experts and like we are committed to this. This is you know, we take an oath to uphold the Constitution and everything else. And um, we are committed to the process. And it's not about partisan politics. It's really just about our democracy. Lisa Brown with us hey. on the Oakland County Megacast. She is the Oakland County Clerk and Registrar of Deeds, joining us on the program today. And uh, Lisa, on the topic of what's going on in Wayne County and putting some perspective on, on that in Oakland County and, and helping people learn the processes that are in place. We've heard a lot of information and a lot of noise also about unbalanced precincts in Wayne County. We're, for for those that are not familiar, what does it mean to have an unbalanced precinct? To have an unbalanced precinct, how is that process then mitigated after the fact of the election to make sure that these precincts, as they are counted, are balanced? And then the second part of that question: In Oakland County, did we have did we have a similar situation or some similar situations where precincts were unbalanced, and how were those addressed? That's a great question, Tyler. Thank you. Um, yes, we have unbalanced precincts in Oakland County. And what that means, and that, that is all discovered during the canvas. That's part of the canvas process. Um, that's that big check that I talked about. We have a three point check of making sure that the number of ballots. So when somebody says it doesn't balance, it's the number of ballots doesn't match the number of voters. And it can be something very simple. In fact, we have to do a report. Um, we're required by law to send a report to the state as to how many precincts, which precincts didn't balance, which if they didn't balance when they came to us for the canvas. And then if we were able to kind of solve the mystery and um, at, or not. So um, for instance, like we had a, a municipality that issued a ballot from I'll say precinct one to a voter, but that voter lived in precinct two. So it didn't balance because, you know, their their name as a voter was in one precinct, but a ballot was executed in a different precinct. Does that make sense? Did I, yes. did I explain that well? Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> so, so sometimes, you know, sometimes they're, they're easier to figure or, um, you know, the poll workers forgot to write that this person spoiled a ballot or do that in the in the spreadsheet and the balance sheet that they forgot to add in that, you know, somebody spoiled a ballot. So one voter used two ballots. They didn't both get counted. One was spoiled. But 
So that is the accounting for, you know, an extra, ba an extra ballot, so to speak. So some of them, you know, it's really easy to figure out. Um, for anyone who works in a precinct, your remarks are always very helpful. So thank you for those because they really can make it a lot easier for us to figure it out. Um, and um, so, but sometimes they're not and, and you just, you can't figure it out. And the big, I'd say like the bigger issue or when it really comes into play, yes, it's, it's you know, unnerving and there's something, you know, if it doesn't balance, like it's this unsolved mystery. It's like a cold case. You really wanna, especially as, a, as an election administrator, you wanna try and figure it out, but sometimes you just, you can't put the pieces back together. But if there's a recount in any race, if, if a precinct doesn't balance, those ballots would not be recountable. So it doesn't, so if we were to have a recount, um, and we saw this in 2016, remember we did a presidential recount um, across the state. Um, and um, I know Wayne County had a lot of uh, attention then as well with the, the uncountable, um, unrecountable precincts because of, you know, some of them did not balance. So. Um, it means that the election results from election night would stand for that precinct only, and then any other precincts that are recountable, they would be recounted. Um, but you know, it happens. It unfortunately, I mean, it happens everywhere. I mean, you know, humans. It's a long day. People make mistakes. Um, you know, we we had an issue in Oakland County that ballots were sent to us twice. Um, you know. That one time they were labeled as as um, precinct ballots, and then the second time as absentee ballots. And so, you know, we had to we caught the mistake and had to correct it. It ended up changing the results of a race because, you know, like I said, I think it was seven precincts were counted twice. Um, so, you know, but it was a human error. And like I said, it's a very long night for a uh, very long day and night for election administrators as well as everyone who works at the election. But um, there are, you know, the it, training does help, better training does help um, as far as making sure that, uh, you know, to help with things being balanced and that sort of thing with having precincts balanced. But sometimes it, you know, it starts, sometimes it starts in the clerk's office. Sometimes it starts uh, with the, like a wrong ballot being issued. Sometimes it starts in the precinct um, with, you know, remarks not mentioning a spoiled ballot. I mean, there's just a gamut of reasons as to why a, ba a, a precinct wouldn't balance. Yeah, because at the end of the day, we are working with humans and we're all human and we make mistakes and uh, we should offer a little bit of grace to some of these poll workers who, a lot of them are volunteers and maybe they're doing it one time or they do it, you know, once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, so like you said, training could be an issue as well. But when we have so much disinformation, especially now in the world of social media, mm -hmm. we heard a lot this past election about voter fraud. When you have misinformation make public, it, it goes like, it, it's like a wildfire, right? It yeah. just continues yeah. to spread. What is your plan of attack to try to um, get out the right information? And in some cases, even when you explain what happened, are there people who aren't going to listen to what really happened anyway? Uh, yes, I think there are, you're always going to have people who are going to choose what who they deem as a credible source. Um, and it's not always going to be the uh, election officials or election administrators or people who you know do this for a living. I mean, to hear um, Chris Thomas, who is one of the most respected um, election experts in the country, to hear him um, attacked and criticized and accused uh, really was so disheartening for me. I've, I've worked with Chris. Um, he, he's an incredible person. Um, he worked for three different um, Secretary of States, both parties, and you know, hearing that kind of rhetoric is just—it's very upsetting. Um, there, you know, when people say, "Oh, there's voter fraud," there's voter fraud, um, you know, they can't give you really any examples. So, um, you know, and I found it interesting with with uh, different chants being said of count all the legal votes, mm -hmm. but then also stop the stop the counting. Well, you know. Absentee ballots, yes, we had a record turnout and it takes a long time to tabulate all those ballots. And it, it's not, 
it's not fraudulent that they aren't all, that we don't have all the results on election night. It takes a long time to process all those ballots. And the fact that it took time meant that the election workers were taking the time to count every legal ballot. So, you know, like the things I talked to um, a, a reporter who I guess it was their station that um, kind of got in the news that their cameraman was bringing in uh, you know, a wagon with his camera equipment and, you know, somebody starts accusing they're bringing in ballots and it wasn't ballots, but, you know, that spread like wildfire, right? Like they're bringing in ballots. They're bringing in, That's not what it was. And, and this paranoia um, that I think has developed is just really such a shame. And what really breaks my heart more than anything is the mistrust and distrust of our electoral process. Um, as you said, we've been doing this for years. And, you know, for to hear these accusations without any um, without any real anything to back them up with no proof, nothing um, is, is just it's difficult. It's hard. And I want people to trust in our process. I want people to know that it works. Yes, mistakes are made, but they're caught like what we had in Oakland County. There was a mistake made, but we caught it. Um, and, you know, that's that's how it goes. So. Um, Again, we'll have elections again next year. Our cities will be having elections. So if you're interested, come and, you know, either sign up to be an election day worker or, um, you know, work in your absentee counting board. You don't have to work in the municipality that you live in. So if you live in a township and there's no election, you can go to a city. You, it, it doesn't matter. You, you can work anywhere or even just come observe our canvas afterwards to see all the things that we do. And, and by the way, on top of that, before the election, there's public accuracy tests of the equipment. That was another thing I've received phone calls about the equipment. And first of all, we don't use Dominion equipment in Oakland County. I know Dominion has been in the news. Um, that's not the vendor that I chose for Oakland County. So that rumor can at least stop in Oakland County. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do. Go look in your local paper, see when your local clerk is holding their public accuracy test where they're testing the equipment to make sure it hasn't been tampered with, to make sure it's calculating things correctly before election day. There's all these things that are, our, our process is very transparent. So just look out there and you'll be able to go and see for yourself how secure and accurate our equipment is and our processes. Lisa Brown with us here on the Oakland County Mega Cash. She's the Oakland County Clerk Register of Deeds, election aside, you and your office, you do so much other work besides just the elections. You have more than 100 employees. Is your office open right now for other non-election uh, issues that people need to contend with? Yeah, yeah. so uh, we've been open by appointment for I don't even know how many months anymore. You know, I think we've all kind of lost track of time, but uh, yeah, we're open by appointment. Um, we are encouraging, especially during these three weeks now, encouraging people that um, if if it's something that you can do online or by mail, to please do that. We are lim we're really trying to limit our appointments um, to people who have to perform business with us that they cannot do by mail or or um, online. So um, oakgov.com/clerk. Uh, you can find out all of our information. You can find out the phone number to call to make an appointment if you do need to come in. Uh, but yes, we you know. We, we're, we're, we're here, we continue to work. I'm in my office right now. We, we continue, uh, we're, we're here. So we're here for you. <laughs> and well, because of our world that we live in right now and the technology, it does make doing so many things easier. We can do it online, but are there some things that have to be done in person that it's creating a backlog at all for you and your employees? Um, so the I would say like in the clerk division, the biggest thing is applying for a concealed pistol license has to be done in person. Um, it's really almost the only thing in that part of the office that has to be done in person. And um, the uh, so when you apply, you after you apply here, then you have to go get fingerprinted. And usually our customers would go across the street to the sheriff's office to get fingerprinted. And they were shut down doing that for months. Um, so we had all these people who, you know, wanted to apply, but no, they couldn't get fingerprinted. So that created a, a, a little bit of a backlog, I guess I would say, um, with that, but, and their appointments are backed up, but now we're giving information of private vendors that also do fingerprinting that are certified to do fingerprinting. So, 
um, th there's other options for people. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working through it. I know there was a story a, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, again, lost track of time, but uh, how, what, what it would take, um, you know, the time frame for Macomb County, Oakland County, and I hate to, you know, bring up Wayne County, but Wayne County, um, and for us and Macomb, basically you could get an, app an appointment within two weeks and Wayne County uh, was much longer, unfortunately, but, um, you know, they're bigger, they have more people too. So, but uh, at the end of the day, we all need to have grace. So I'm sorry, we're running out of time, but, uh, <laughs> thank you to you and your team and all the hard work that you've been doing during this pandemic. We appreciate it. We are at 12 noon, so we're going to wrap it up. For the Friday edition of the Oakland County Megacast, Tyler and I will be back next week, Monday at 10 a.m.